the ill-fated Tekkensoft's Thunder Force franchise, first originated back in 84 for various crazy obscure Japanese home computers. Here's a little history. For those unaware of the franchise's origins, it all started back in 83 through 84 on various obscure as fuck Japanese home computers, including the Sharp X1 and MZ1500, the Fujitsu FM7, and even the NEC PC6001 Mark II, PC8801 Mark II, and PC9801 by the once active and emerging Technosoft, within which are controlling the Fire Leo fighter craft, sanctioned and summoned by the Galaxy Federation during its ongoing threat of missions to seek out and destroy the Orn Empire's numerous base installments, turrets, and shield generators in each occupied area, and eventually their generator-supported asteroid field, the aptly named Dyradizer. Upon the shining moment of the game's success, despite its primitive ass design and having barely any music, with the obvious exception of a few versions within which they bastardized the Williams Hell Overture, cause yeah, the Japanese love their classic symphonies, save for that god-awful ass ear-rapey soundbite. Not only did the sole female creator, Kotori Oshimura, leave the company to form Arsis Software, later of Star Cruiser fame, its sequels started branching throughout the years, while Technosoft focused on other titles, most notably Herzog and Herzog's Y, Elemental Master and Neketsu Oyako, before it dramatically went under, leading to the eventual seizure of its trusted assets over to 21 Company and Sega in 2001, thereby functioning as the penultimate indicated company's research and development division. And now for the main event, our first choice, Thunder Force 2 for the Genesis, circa 1989, and a direct port of its original Sharp X68000 counterpart. And before I forget, yes, this was distributed for the US by Sega. As always, who could have guessed, we have a lot to get to, so before we kick off this latest four-part analysis, I'd like to pass along the usual acknowledgments to the following groups, individuals, organizations, etc. Brooklyn Interactive Group and Somerville Media Center, as always, Kenzie Bach and Kristen Mobilia, both political candidates running for Boston City Councilor District 8, Boston Open Screen, DIY The Show, Bella, aka Girl with Yellow Spoon from LA, Kayla, aka Plum Drop 11, also from Massachusetts, just like yours truly, Chavez Slovakia, The Mount Vernon Kid, Matt Azaro, aka Cygnus Destroyer 20XX, Matt Lister from Dover, New Hampshire, Sammy Moa and Moa Bassi, both online dating coaches, Joey Pellegrino, Emily Schmidt, Tammy Pudina, Ray Vasquez, aka The Lava Buster, from Ray of Sunshine and Theratopolis, Gabriel J. de Betancourt, aka Riley Sky 100, The Weird Local Film Festival Team and Triple Yet Productions, James Rolf and Mike Matei from Cinemassacre, Brian D. Felice, James E. Keda, aka the Michael character, Ian Bergeson from 16 Bit Heroes in the Offseason, Jules Carrazza from Gen Y Films and Goliath Post, Michelle or Autumn Lee Bales, aka Old School Gamer Mama from Gatlinburg, Tennessee, Amber Hooks Karavoxny from Anderson, Indiana, Xbit Gaming, Mine is Gaming Fest, and finally, the Massachusetts Production Coalition. With these out of our system, onto the main premise concerning this second offering. Set sometime following the previous Thunder Force, the latest and most advanced version of the Fire Leo craft, codename Exaliza, is sent by the Galaxy Federation to seek out and eradicate the Orn Empire's newly crafted battleship Pleolos. This opposing, massive as hell battleship has not only managed to crumble the ever loving fuck out of the planets Rada and Nepora, aka Nebula, both part of the aforementioned Galaxy Federation, aka the Lone Star System and the US Genesis localization, the latter of which Orn housed the brooding battleship deep under upon their capture and besiegement, hence the impetus behind Exilisa's immediate threat of search and destroy operations. <laughs> While it's almost the same song and dance routine as its predecessor, in terms of gameplay, of course, hence the constant motion 8-way top view areas, there's an unexpected twist. Horizontal scrolling areas that take place following the former indicated types, which I'll take up on momentarily. 
In each of the nine perspective variable areas, there's four Orn bases you're tasked with eliminating along the way to proceed to the ladder type areas while not only keeping constantly swarming legions of opposing threats at bay, but also experimenting with different weapons, with the Exilisa's default being both a twin shot and back shot for unleashing two beams forward and two on the front and rear sides of it at the same time, respectively, as well as a special ground shot for dealing with on-ground targets against an Amco Bandai Xevious. Getting to the diverse area of additional weapons and special accessories depending on the type of area you're kicking serious ass in, acquired by destroying every turret and or base or both the blue and orange carrier units in the top view and side view areas individually, you've got your wide shot which creates four yellow orbs, one in the back and three in the front, a laser in the form of either one or two blue beams depending on the type of perspective area, with some also flashing in orange, cutting through opposing adversaries and barriers, typical of most shmups, despite being deprived of your ground shot, a five-way in the form of a field of light blue crescent-shaped projectiles formed around the ship, destroy a weak-ass three-way plasma blast which, tragically, is much less efficient than the five-way, the series staples Clash and Hunter for the top few areas, both a circular 180-degree field of heat beams and a volley of homing plasma spheres that automatically target and decimate the ever-loving fuck out of every nearby or faraway threat on screen, respectively, despite the latter's instantaneous restriction of the ground shot, just like the laser, as well as the Mega Flash, five yellow fan-like blades fired diagonally and horizontally on both sides of your fighter craft, the Wave Shot, a rapid zigzag missile barrage deployed in conjunction with Exilisa's normal shot, the Side Blaster, two missile pods which are deployed vertically above and below your fighter craft simultaneously in conjunction with the very same normal shot, and finally the Nova, a three-way white and blue beam ring volley deployed along with the normal shot opposite Exilisa's direction of movement, for instance, left in favor of right, up in favor of down, and vice versa, ditto for the diagonals, thus predating the Shurikens and Victa Kind Jurudon's Imperium by three years. All of which not only can be deployed via B and swapped in between via A and or C in tandem with the D-pad's traditional free-range movement in both scenarios, but are lost instantly upon death regardless of whether or not you're using them, despite still being intact between each perspective appropriate stage shift. Did I somehow forget to mention the various accessories that you obtain along the way? The Claw, aka the Craw, floating defense turret pods that act as options for your fighter craft, two of which it can carry, providing its own brand of firepower in the form of red bullets and absorbing any and all incoming enemy fire, and the Roll, not to be confused with Mega Man's sister, mind you all, which boosts the speed of the Claws, will also meet the same motherfucking fate? Oh, a few other tidbits to note, the 1-ups and the breaker system, the latter of which is a temporary barrier that shields you from all damage, hence its colors indicating how long it'll stay active, regardless of how much damage you took, can also be discovered in rare intervals. Even with this massive as boss plethora of benefits, I wouldn't expect any goddamn remorse or mercy from this game whatsoever, cause it'll strangle your ass uncontrollably until it absorbs your soul worse than Bobby and Gwen from Gleaming the Cube and Shang Tsung respectively, hence of course, the limelight of our usual upcoming case. The rudimentary controls are at the very least by the numbers and manageable enough to get the ultimate gist of, and as extremely fucking torturous as the gameplay framework is, it's far from a detestable ass buzzkill and a board to take advantage of, and then some. Challenge-wise, if you're highly contemplating on any chances for top-notch survival, here are some heavy full-on pointers of which to take serious heed, and I'd listen very carefully. First and foremost, always be aware of your surroundings, and I don't mean just studying the patterns of every incoming enemy and their obvious offensive habits, but also the precise locations of each mandatory target base in the top few sections, and while the landscape's plentiful with a vast area of settings including natural, futuristic, urban, barren, and even the historically inspired settings alike, hazards are afoot, in which case, be wary of them as well as your fighter craft's narrow-ass hitbox, and keep your deaths to an absolute minimum during every mission. Secondly, strike first and strike hard. In other words, don't just dodge every incoming projectile, but mainly concentrate as much firepower as possible on your key targets, especially the four top view bases and the side-scrolling mini and main bosses with the latter two types featuring the following. The Silverfish piloted heavy load carrier, code LSS SF002, followed by the Persuader anti-battleship machine, code LSS SF026S, and the Nepura, aka Nebula, spaceport. The Stalwart heavy aerial support machine, code LSS SF025, followed by the Elephant Mobile Siege base tank, code LSS GFNT-1, underneath the Galaxy Federation cityscape, the two automated pincer pursuit machines, code LSS PFX-1, followed by the armored Gomu attack organism, code NPS-04, and the abandoned underground cavern pipeline, the phasing Bogart pursuit machine, code LSS PFO-17, followed by the ultra-heavy Pleolos defense system, Polyphemus, code LSS SF-001-D, and the ruined passage of the Forbidden City, and finally, the Orn Emperor's Pleolos battleship itself, hovering over both a field of lava and through hyperspace, is you're striving to seek out and neutralize its central defenses before reaching its main beam emitter, to name the whole damn lineup, of course. Five words.
Third, experiment with different weapons, basically determining which ones are suitable for each altercation or aren't worth fuck all, in which case, ignore them or die to ditch them. And most importantly, since the top few areas are time sensitive, the faster you destroy all four enemy bases, the more bonus lives you'll earn. So don't fuck around too long or you won't get Donkey Dick. Christ, Rambo 3 anyone? <laughs> Starting out with any amounts between 1 to 5 ships and a generous yet finite supply of continues, precisely 6, but then again, it may depend on what difficulty mode you're starting off with, not to mention the instant access to later stages via the hidden option screen by A, B, or C in conjunction with Start, despite being required to start from scratch to see the real ending. Space Harrier 2, Turtles Fall of the Foot Clan and Nemesis much? In taking these necessary hints into steadfast account, you shouldn't endure too much of a mind grain inducing mindfuck, reveling even those of both the Rocky Horror Picture Show and Total Recall combined, striving to tackle every intense operation after another, notwithstanding how frequent your defeats will occur if your senses of urgency and attrition happen to shit the goddamn bed. Graphically, for a 30-year-old internationally recognized follow-up to a Japan-only home computer shmup title, the designers at Technosoft truly went above and beyond in bedazzling us with the most diverse, detailed, and eye-pleasing landscapes whose themes I suggest referring back to even at this juncture, no less. In addition, the main Fire Leo Model 2 X leaves a fighter craft isn't too much of an eyesore either, both during the top view and side-scrolling scenes alike, one might add, not to mention the effects of the various range of weapons that it unleashes and the accessories it takes advantage of in the most dire as hell situations, nor are the constant constantly spawning enemy swarms, the more robust and resilient artillery guarding them, and the flashing projectiles they give off, amongst other plausible elements. There's nothing too redundant in any of the combined background and foreground portions of the side-scrolling areas whatsoever, let alone the obvious yet nostalgically stunning use of fuse and said plethora of elements. And to top it all off, they do a hell of a lot more than give off that ultimate arcade vibe most of us have been indulging ourselves in time and time again, as of most of the 16-bit titles that came before and after it alike. And as usual, even at this point, I don't see any fucking reason whatsoever to go on any further. Oh shit, no. Musically, along with the sound effects, orchestrated by none other than the incomparable Tomomi Otani, the extremely ample selection of tunes are nothing short of ear candy filled bless, with a rather sparse dose of lethargy and a few others, in one complete package, thanks to the console's own YM2612 FM synth sound chip engineered by Yamaha, not to mention the futuristic rock vibes they provide that rival even those of the Hong Kong Cavaliers from Buckaroo Bantai across the 8th dimension, and even the fantastic plastics. If they're watching this, I'm saying this with due respect to Tyson and Miranda Markley themselves. As inessential and disproportionate as the sound effects are, they at least go well together with what's happening within the game's perspective universe, notwithstanding how they are or might be recycled from and or within other Technosoft titles. Ditto for the unintelligible yet somehow audible voice samples heard not only at the beginning, you know the ex Lisa report, but also in game whenever you nab every weapon and or accessory along the way. And I listened to some of these very carefully. No, next slide, wait a sec. No. Oh, and another thing, take note of my top 5 favorite songs shown here, with a couple of honorable mentions displayed underneath. Replayability wise, taking into consideration how this intrinsic offering has been getting its share of unfair as shit flack due to being the black sheep of the franchise, and that the mandatory, time sensitive top few areas can be extremely exhausting and demand a Herculean level of adherence, most of all, and that its mechanics aren't well polished like its later follow ups, amongst many other cons I've not only discovered but have articulated so far here, which won't be echoed to the extreme goddamn brink of tedium. Thunder Force 2, against all odds, is a solid and sufficient enough shmup worthy of an adequately organized library in the comfort of your own domicile. Therefore, you'd be shooting yourself in the fucking foot to pass this one up. Ditto for its soon to be analyzed sequels. Exhibit B Thunder Force 3, released the following year, except this was distributed by Hot B, aka Starfish SD. Taking place yet another century later, the Galaxy Federation and the Orn Empire are at odds yet again, as the former indicated faction sends out yet another variation of the Fire Leo, codenamed Styx. Yet again, not to be confused with the 70s hard rock band and or the staff-wielding fighter from Comic Zone, released half a decade later, to destroy the latter indicated opposing faction's five cloaking devices on its neighboring planets, Hydra, Gorgon, Saren, Ethis, or Hydus, according to the arcade version, and Ellis, before reaching their end-all-be-all target. 
Gameplay wise, it's pretty much ditto like the previous Thunder Force adventure, except for two major changes. Bye bye and rest in peace to those mind numbing top view areas, and you're able to pick a planet on which to start your quest off from the get go. Shit, Mega Man much? The control setup has also been altered. By default, A changes the sticks of speed between slow to fast, even while paused, B lets it fire off its weapons, and C swaps said weapons around at will, but can be configured beforehand at the option screen via A, B, or C in conjunction with start at the title. In terms of the weapon and accessory lineup, the Wave and Hunter are back, hence the orange heat arcs and the round homing blue orbs respectively, except with three new additions. The Sever, a volley of long blue beams that replaces the Twin Shot upon acquisition. The Lancer, three rows of razor sharp blue beams that also fire front and back, thus replacing the back shot, and the Fire, two missiles that are deployed above and below the stick simultaneously. Not to mention the claws also make a return, except in the form of floating turrets, and if you have the fire on you, they'll summon two blue beams on either side as well as the shield, except in true Gradius fashion, the barrier changes color upon taking hits or leaning in too close to any structure, and as expected, are lost instantly upon fucking death, depending on which of them you're using, thus relegating yourself back to the starting twin and back shots, that is after you've obtained the Sever and Lancer respectively. The majority of the five areas, and yes the later ones also count, include all sorts of hazards and kinks to take note of, which make even the extending bars in the previous Thunder Force seem like child's play by comparison. I mean seriously, who could forget the missiles that are launched from both the top and bottom, and eventually collide with each other on Hydra, the lava pillars and flame orbs on Gorgon, the strong underwater wind currents on Saren, the moving rock structures and single leaping and falling asteroids on Hydus, aka Ethus, and even the falling icicles and closing icicle gates on Ellis, amongst various unexpected dangers out there. Right, but are at the very least far from an absolute pain in the ass to evade. Compared to the previous Thunder Force, this third offering is way more of a cakewalk here in terms of not only how often the extra lives are provided, both via the usual point intervals and upon the discoveries of mini stick spacecrafts, but also the outcome of each boss confrontation as long as you're aware enough of how to make them your forever bitches at the end of each planet area while attempting like a boss to avoid any unforeseen chaotic collisions. The mechanic gargoyle on planet Hydra, the twin Vulcans on planet Gorgon, the kinkfish on planet Saren, the G Lobster on planet Hydus, the massive mobile forts on planet Ellis, the interior core of Orange Cerberus battleship in hyperspace, the two heavy-duty defense computer walls in the horn base, and finally a white swirly armed guard machine with two energy waves, one in blue and another in orange, followed by the Orn Empire's massive omnicidal ruling biocomputer chaos itself. Just because it's easy peasy however, that doesn't mean there aren't any shit attack worthy nerve wracking elements to take into account, especially during the latter half of this interstellar, hell besmeared, no holds barred hallucination of an adventure no less. At least the controls are still the same as ever minus any flaws. In other words, it's your own goddamn fault if you get your ass wrecked, but the always intense and bracing gameplay is definitely something you wouldn't want to run the fuck away from, ever. Challenge wise, please take this golden opportunity to refer back to what I took up about the boss confrontations since I intend to avoid turning into a freaking broken record here. Apart from everything else, getting a clear cut idea when to watch out for any visual cue and or environmental hazard within any area is key in this epic ass shmup, let alone experimenting with different weapons for not only the end bosses, but for the wall buildups on Hydus, aka Ethus, and the gates in the Orn base, amongst numerous vehement trials and tribulations you're bound to endure within each area. Also, the same pointers I've advised earlier apply here as well as in the next two sequels, ditto for every shmup I've covered so far up until this point, so refer back to them whenever necessary. Starting off with 4 lives and 7 continues, either depending on or regardless of which difficulty mode you kick things off with beforehand. I wouldn't get too discouraged if any of said trials and or tribulations turn out to be raging, insubordinate, fragmented bitches with 1 and 1 quarter foot long broken tree branches shoved halfway up their asses. On the graphical forefront, in direct, rigorous comparisons to Thunder Force 2, the presentations received a well-deserved and substantial leg up in terms of every key foreground and background element, dependent on which stage you're kicking serious ass in, especially the wavy flame effects on Gorgon, the waterfalls halfway through Hydus, and even the ginormous and dramatically detailed Cerberus battleship reminiscence of Irem's R-Type franchise, to name a rather notable few. Your main stick's battlecraft, both in the opening title and the ending sequences, as well as during the majority of its in-game adventure, is a hell of a lot more dynamic than the Exaliza in terms of the vast range and appearances of the weapons it deploys, and the few coinciding accessories it takes advantage of, likewise for the ever-materializing opposing armadas of Orn enemies that put even the likes of every greatest enemy and or boss to absolute fucking contempt. As ever, nothing's too superfluous or unsuitable to anyone's liking here. Music and sound wise, with the returning Gotani at the helm, this time alongside Toshiharu Yamanishi, the usual synth pop formula infused with the newly featured, situation appropriate tracks doesn't disappoint as usual thanks to their ability to keep the game from getting too fucking stale, as one might expect. 
The sound effects and voiceover sound bites, again concerning the latter, heard whenever any weapon and or accessory item is nabbed, are far from an extremely aggravating bother, despite how often the opposite might take effect at certain intervals. As always, taking out of our top 10 socks displayed here, with the usual two honorable mentions shown underneath. Replayability-wise, due to the aforementioned introductory stage select function, which, of course, provides the player with a plethora of different strategies to reach your ultimate goal, as well as the massive area of weapons you're able to use in order to lay the ultimate smackdown on the asses of every enemy swarm that comes your way, and the ability to adjust your ship's speed at any time, which, from here on in, became the series' main staple, amongst other features, there's no doubt in my mind that you'll be revisiting Thunder Force 3 as often as, say, Apex Legends. In other words, you'd be high off your fucking ass to leave this memorable classic of a shmup out in the goddamn blistering ass called... Before I forget, this was retooled to the arcades later that same year under the title Thunder Force AC. In Japan only, of course, except with a few graphical alterations, stages being removed in favor of three exclusive new stages, with some taking faithfully after the previous Thunder Force offering, and was ported to the SNES the following year by Kemco Seika, or just Seika themselves after the two split up, in association with Toshiba EMI and Technosoft themselves, under the title Thunder Spirit, but was not only made a hell of a lot easier, some serious slowdown was applied as well, cause fucking Nintendo! 